plant that, that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, because I mean, I feel like my tongue is like a pen of a ready writer by the grace of God and your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A million ta thanks for your prayers, for standing with us, believing and willing to change your perception, your paradigm. And it's a journey, you know, it's a journey. So let's pray and jump into what God has for us today. And I believe, I think people will be continue to join. I encourage you to be on time so we can start on time. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us to come together as a kingdom family from across the globe. You called us out of darkness, out of Egypt, out of Babylon, to be part of your kingdom, to be part of your assignment on the earth, Father. I thank you for this privilege. I thank you for the word that you are going to give to us today, Father. Lord, let that word fall to the good ground. I thank you for your mercy and your grace over us. Your favor, Father, let this seed fall on good ground. Let it bring 30, 60, and 100 fold. I cancel every miscommunication, misunderstanding, any kind of demonic intervention in any way or form, because we are going to engage in an age old battle that began in the Garden of Eden. We thank you for your grace. Cover us. I cancel every assignments of the enemy in any way or form because of this word against any one of us or you're connected to us. And we give you all the glory, honor, and power, strength, wisdom, riches belongs to Jesus Christ, to our King. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Welcome, everyone. Amen. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the Ecclesia. And we are on a journey. We are on a journey discovering, rediscovering God's purpose, his plan, and his principles, his patterns from God's word. It's going to take 250 years in total. So <laughs> hope you're planning to be around here for another at least 200 years. You know, some of you are 50 years. I'm just joking, okay? So don't... <laughs> So the other purpose for which Jesus was, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. He wants to build his ecclesia, the kingdom nation. But something happened to humans. Our understanding and our perception of God. And that's why I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. Because what we are going to hear today, and I know I shared about this trees, two trees in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, those two trees, because it is very important for us to understand these two trees and what they represented and why God put them in the garden. You know, sometimes didn't you wonder why God put that terrible tree there? If that tree wasn't there, then Adam would not have been tempted to eat from the wrong tree. The enemy wouldn't have the chance to tempt him. Why would God, such a loving God, you know, who's the loving father, why would God do such a terrible thing or give such an opportunity? He could have just avoided it. He could have just not planted that terrible tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we say that because we don't understand God's purpose and what happened on the earth before Adam arrived. If we are to understand why God put those two trees in the garden, we have to understand the history of this earth before humans were created. That's what I encouraged you to read the Gospel of the Kingdom book. Please go to our website, download it for free, absolutely free for how many more days until the 31st of this month. Those 13 volumes of books on the kingdom are absolutely free to anybody who wants it. And I encourage you to read it, read it and reread it. You know, some of, I asked the people, hey, did you read that book? And they said, no. 
then I feel sad. Oh my gosh, then how can you make progress in God's kingdom? Get out of religion because the damage religion has brought to humanity, it is unfathomable. It is like, oh my gosh, when are we going to heal or get rid of the damage? But there's only one way to get rid of the damage to heal the damage that religion has brought to upon humanity is the message that you're going to hear today. We have to understand about these two trees. That is the only solution for religion, to get rid of religion and the damage and the enemy's strongholds. You know, Jesus defeated the devil on the cross. Everybody believes that, right? He crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. But then why Satan act like nothing happened to him? Why? What is the reason? Is because of this teaching. <laughs> because the reason is in these two trees. Why Satan seems to be doing what he's doing, even though his authority was taken by Christ back on the cross, why would he continue to do what he's doing? Because of these two trees. And it is so important. This teaching that we are going to hear today has to become our operating system, new operating system for the entire kingdom, nation, and our future. I pray that the Holy Spirit will seal this word into our spirit, man, because we are so programmed by religion and the religious spirit that our entire being is formed by the knowledge of good and evil. From the time we were born, we were brought up in that system. Now to transition from that system into the tree of life, it is a constant battle and struggle because we are prone. We are so ingrained to think and do and judge and assume everything based on the knowledge of good and evil. That's how we were formed. But the good news is God Almighty never intended, wanted humans to live by the knowledge of good and evil. Can you believe that? God never intended that. He wanted us to live by the tree of life. What is the tree of life? Being led by the Holy Spirit. That is the tree of life, not walking around because something written on the wall, 10 commandments or 6,000 rules and regulations. No, being led by the Holy Spirit. Those are the sons and daughters of God. But we always think in the basis of what is good, what is evil. What is evil? What is good? That's how we think. Instead of going to God with every situation you have. Oh, my Lord, my God, the Holy Spirit is speaking. Go to God, the Father, with every situation that you have, every questions you have, every struggle and pain and every nonsense you have. Go to God, your Father, and talk to him, please. Instead of making a preconceived judgment and conclusion based on the knowledge of good and evil tree, go to your heavenly Father and talk to him and get his perspective. And we think the perspective we have coming from God, no, 90% of them it's not. 90% of the per perception and judgments and conclusions and decisions we make is not based on the Holy Spirit direction. It's already based on the preconceived idea and the system of thinking was put into us based on the knowledge of good and evil. That's how we operate. And it's not easy for us to change. And it takes battles after battles after battles after battles to come out of the system. And I'm not joking. Battles after battles after battles. Morning, evening, and lunchtime. You have to be aware of what's going on because we are so prone to think based on the knowledge of good and evil. Our DNA was formed like that. Now we have to go back and reprogram that DNA based on the tree of life.
you know, when I came to the U.S. many years ago, one of the things I heard in churches, pastors and preachers will say from the pulpit, God is good. And the people will repeat all the time. And the, then the preacher will say all the time, God is good. We believe that. He is good. He is good all the time. And he is love. What is love? Love is patient, kind. First Corinthians 13. I want to give you a homework. Please write this down. Please go and read 1 Corinthians 13, the definition of love, and compare that with the knowledge and understanding you have of God and see if they match. If that is the God that you serve, that you believe in your heart, because he is love. That's what the Bible says. Not romantic and the, the love that you see on movies. No, no. The everlasting love, unconditional love, the agape love. That's what Paul says. Love believes all things, forgives all things, is patient, is kind, believes the good. Is that the belief system that you have of God or were you scared by some religious spirit when you were growing up and that scare and that fear is still deep down in your spirit, man, in your DNA. And when a situation comes up, when a circumstances rise up, the first thing that hits you is fear. And if that is so, we are still under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If something happens to us, the first response toward that situation is fear. We are still under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have not made the transition into the tree of life. Because, why? Because when something happens to you, child of God, Monday morning, we repeat that in the church, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. But Monday morning, when the circumstance comes up, we begin to doubt the goodness of God. That is the reality to many of us including myself, why we doubt the goodness of God on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, when that tire in your car goes flat, but the purpose behind that tire going flat, because God had a divine appointment for you through that circumstances. That's why that tire went flat, because there was somebody he wanted to meet. I'm just saying here, you know, because that happened to me many times. Unusual circumstances, God orchestrates his divine appointments. But we begin to complain and we murmur, we get upset, we angry and oh my God, now where is God? Look at this. I was going to this meeting and this appointment and my tire goes flat or something happens and we go into that knowledge of the good and evil tree mode. And that needs to change because God is good all the time. And he is love all the time. And then the question is, why majority of the people in the world wants nothing to do with him? Maturity means maturity. And we know we grew up in religion, the damage that we received and our perception and understanding now we are still discovering and we are getting a glimpse of what and who God is, his purpose, his kingdom. And we are like, oh my goodness, graciousness. How did we miss this, right? When people read on all these books and come and tell me, Abraham, I wish I had this book 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I wish I had read on all these books. And those books are not perfect. I tell you myself, <laughs> those books are not perfect. Because I am still learning. I am still exploring. And I am still believing. And growing in the knowledge of God. Because the Bible says his divine power. Second Peter 1 verse 3 says his divine power has given to us all things we need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who has called us into virtue. 
1 Peter 1 verse 3. Please write that down. His divine power has given to us, not going to give to us when we fast and pray and give tithe and offering and when we do something good. He says it's already given to us all things. Everybody say all things. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these things. When Bible says all, it includes all. Every need that you have, emotional, physical, spiritual, financial. Then why it is not coming to us? Because there is something happened. In the knowledge of God we have. The understanding and the perception of God we inherited. I don't know when I'll be able to finish this teaching, but I can't even flip one slide yet. <laughs> because it says his divine power has given it to us, already given. It's already there. Everything that you need for your life on this earth, every need that you have, whether it is house or car or clothes or whatever, it is already given it to you. That's what the Bible says. Then why it is not coming to us? Why many people struggle and for their sustenance, for survival? Because it's not God who is withholding that from you, people of God. It is not God who is blocking that things from you. It is the knowledge that we have of God. There's something happened to humanity in their perception of God, there's a wrong impression came into the hearts and minds of people through something that happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam chose to eat from the wrong tree. That's where it began. Unless we go back and correct it. The gospel that we have received is so incomplete. You know, people say, oh, we believe the full gospel. What they mean is they are going to go to heaven when they die. <laughs> That's not the full gospel. That's only part of the gospel, a small portion of the gospel. The full gospel is we have to understand Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, what happened there. That's where the gospel came. That's why Jesus came. That's why the cross came. Because this entire life on earth depends and runs on three trees. The entire life on earth, Lord, Holy Spirit of God, I am going to explode here. The whole life on earth based on the stories of three trees. Can you believe that, people of God? Those two trees were in the garden. Do you know which is the third tree? Can somebody guess it for me? Write it in the chat box. What was the third tree? The entire life on this earth is dependent and based on the story of three trees. Yes, yeah, somebody said the cross. That is the third tree. That is true. I will buy you chocolate when I see you. Very good. <laughs> so this entire life on this earth is built on the stories of three trees. Those two trees were in the garden. What I, do you know what I have noticed as I traveled across the world? This is happening in Europe, in Asia, in Africa. Every religion has trees attached to their belief system. Even the Bible talks about God said, you burn incense under every tree. There are specific trees that Every religion respects and believes that it has some kind of supernatural attachment to it. Where did that came from? It came from the Garden of Eden. Because trees play such an important role for our life and sustenance. Because at the breath that we breathe is what the trees breathe out. And the trees breathe in what we breathe out. Without trees, we cannot live on this planet Earth. But we don't worship trees. We don't venerate and burn anything on the trees. Those trees are a blessing. Like I said before, if there is famine somewhere, plant trees. If there is any kind of wrong that has gone into the nature, trees are the solution, the medicine, or whatever to fix it. 
So the three trees are the, the, the two trees that we see in the Garden of Eden and on the cross that reversed everything those that evil tree has brought upon humanity, the knowledge of good and evil. There are only three major problems on the earth. Three major problems. If you can take every problem, whether it is sin problem, devil problem, hunger problem, whatever problem, gang problem, drug problem, you name it. <laughs> Any, every problem, if you combine them into categories, you can fix them under these three major problems. Number one, there's a misunderstanding about God. That's why all this religion came about. Why there is so many religions worshipping so many gods and goddesses. In India alone, there are 33 million gods and goddesses. And you can still continue to make God. Even today, there's no problem with that. There is no shortage of gods in the market. You can buy them, sell them, and there's plenty of them. Why? Because there's a misunderstanding misconception came into the hearts of humans from the Garden of Eden, a wrong perception, wrong impression. Even though God is good, even though he is love, majority of the people doesn't want to do anything with him. Why? Because of this wrong understanding that they have of God. Instead of running to him, people tend to run away from him. He is good. So when you believe that he is good, you will run to him when you have a problem with your problem, with your questions, instead of running away from him, instead of doubting his goodness, instead of questioning his ways and his plans, you will run to his feet for answers. God is the most misunderstood and misrepresented person in the universe. Why there is so many denominations among Christians? If you all believe the same gods, read the same Bible, believe in the same Holy Spirit, believing the same word of God, why there is so many denominations and divisions? Why? Because of the misconception and the wrong interpretation of God's word because they missed the purpose, the plan, the pattern, and the principles of God. That's where it started. It started in the Garden of Eden. Religion misrepresent God to humanity. And where this all started, that's where we're going to find out today. What is the second major problem on the earth? We are misinformed about our purpose. We all grew up hearing all kinds of stuff why God made us, except the real reason why he made us. I was part of this international apostolic conference recently, a few weeks ago, and people are afraid to use the word dominion. Can you believe that? Genesis 1, 26, the word dominion. Why? Why people are afraid to use it? Because of the misrepresentation, misinformation they received about the word dominion. Dominion doesn't mean dominating. That's what they think about dominion. Dominion is not domination. Domination is demonic. Dominion is kingdom. It's two different words, belongs to two different kingdoms. So just because somebody used it the wrong way, we cannot throw the baby with the bath towel and say, we don't use the word dominion anymore. No, then we are missing our purpose. You can sing Kumbaya for all day long. It's not going to change anything in this world unless you come back to your purpose for which God created humans and accept that mandate of dominion. Nothing is going to change. You can visit all kinds of places and do all kinds of good things and good deeds. Only thing will repair, restore the things that has been damaged by the fall of Adam is when we are able to go back to our purpose. And there's a whole series of teaching about what is dominion, what God meant by it. Please go back to listen to some of this teaching or read the book called Purpose, Calling, and Gifts. I 
explain it according to the grace that he has given it to me in those books. Dominion is domination, is not domination, it is not colonization. Dominion is not colonizing or colonialism. It is not. We were misinformed, majority of us. I don't know any one of us brought up based on our purpose. We were misinformed. I was misinformed. Even though I grew up in church, went to church four times a week, I was misinformed about my purpose. I had to unlearn and relearn about my purpose for which God has created. And when people hear it, the teachings on the true dominion, and it enlightens them, it opens their understanding, opens their mind and their spirit and say, wow, this is God. This is the truth. It's not dominating. Somebody is going to some country, to poor countries and dominating people and making them slaves. That's not dominion. That is domination. That is demonic. We have to come back to the true knowledge of God and his purpose concerning ours. So that is the second major problem that we have. First one is the misunderstanding of God. Many of us grew up knowing that God is holding us like a little bug on a string, uptight. And if you miss once, he's going to throw you into hell. That's not the God of the Bible. And I'm going to show it to you. The third thing, the third major problems that we have on the earth today in our life is things that happened to us from the time of conception till now have created a distorted and defective view of ourselves, God, others, and the world around us. Things that happen to us, you and me, everybody. Things have happened to you and me. But you are not what happened to you. You are what God says that you are. Do not define your life and the value and your destiny based on what happened to you or what others have spoken of you. You are not what happened to you. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we have to tear down those old foundations and altars, demonic altars, demonic strongholds that came into our life, the misconception about you hate yourself and you don't like yourself. And, and we keep on repeating about the things that happened to us for the next 40 years. Please don't do that because you are not what happened to you. You are created in the image and likeness of God. You didn't have to do nothing to become like God. You were created like him in his image and in his likeness. You don't have to do nothing to become like God. That is the first lie the enemy has in, insisted or inserted into the minds of Adam and Eve. You have to eat from that wrong tree that God said not to eat. Then you will become like God. Lord, have mercy. Things have happened to us. We have to deal with them from the time of conception. Sometime generation before, generations before, what came to us through bloodline, default settings and mindsets and paradigms that came to us through the DNA and through the bloodline, that must be corrected intentionally. What you're experiencing today, the breakup of your marriage, the wrong decisions that you made, the problems in your family life, in your finances, it did not start with you. It came to you. And that needs to be addressed with the right knowledge of God. You have to do a surgery on every situation, every mindset, every concept that you have about yourself and God and the world and the events that is happening. You have to do a supernatural Holy Spirit surgery with the word of God. Because why? Because God's word is sharper than any surgical sword or blade that you can find 
out in the world. That's what the Bible says. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through the marrows and the veins and even to the DNA of a human being. That's why he gave us this word, the sh most sharpest thing on this planet Earth. It can penetrate any evil that has been done to you and correct it, fix it, heal it. But when you do it, that process will be painful. But when you finish that process, come through that surgery and you feel better. <laughs> Somebody say, Amen! Woo! <laughs> Amen! Amen! But when Amen. you go through that process, it will be it's painful. You will cry for life. You want to run. You want to pick up the bags and run. But when you finish, when that process is finished, you will see, oh my God, this is why God took me through all those fires and all those things. Now I see it. Now I understand it. So hold on. Don't run. Don't try to escape. Don't jump out of the fire <laughs> before the time. Don't jump out of the fire. You know, some one of my friends said, don't jump out of the pan into the fire. <laughs> I said, Lord, have mercy. I don't want to jump into the fire from the pan. The pan is better. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. So, Things have happened to us, but you are not what happened to you. You, you are not where you were born. Your destiny is not dependent on where you were born, the circumstances you were born, or your family you were born. Come out of it. That's why God has to call his people out of Egypt and Babylon in the Old Testament. And he is doing the same thing today. He is calling his people out of Egypt and Babylonian system. Oh, I have to say this about the government. You know, this is, this is I'm learning. Okay, This is an example of me learning from God. Still learning. Tomorrow I'll be learning. When if I'm 99, I'll be still learning. Why God did not want Joseph or Moses or Daniel to take over those kingdoms, you know, to replace the king or to kill that, those kings and, and establish a Christian nation? Why God didn't do that? I couldn't understand it for a long time. Why only God put his people up to the second in command? He did not replace the king with them. They only reached up to the second in command. Why God did not remove those kings, the Pharaoh or the Nebuchadnezzar or, or Cyrus or any of those kings and, and put a God's child in the position of that kingdom? Oh, because I didn't understand this for a long time because those governments, those systems are not representation of his kingdom or his kingdom government. God's kingdom government has entirely different operating system. But you and I are called to be the light of this world. In that court, in that palace, you can be. But not replacing that king, because that's not what we are called to do. That's why anytime you try to establish a Christian nation by appointing a Christian president, it won't work well. It never worked. That's why you need to read this book that is coming out, The Birthing of a Kingdom Nation. What type of government God envisioned to establish on the earth? How does the kingdom government look like? It's not one man on the top or a man or a woman on the food chain. That is the Babylonian system. That is the Gentile system of government. Kingdom government, there's only one person on top. There's only one head that is God, that is Jesus Christ. And we are all sit with him around the same table. Whether it is an apostle, you're an apostle, don't worry, sit down around the table. You're not above anybody. You're a prophet, sit down. You're not above anybody. You're not above the believer. 
You're a co-laborer with Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. In God's kingdom, we are not above anybody. There is only one above. That is God Almighty. That's the king. I don't rule over anybody. God did not call anybody to rule over anybody. God wants to be that person. That's why it grieved him when they went to ask Samuel for a king like the Gentile nations. It grieved God. Because he never wanted a system of government like that for his people. Because he wants to rule and reign over them. But what kind of system was it? Well, you had to wait to read this book that is coming out on January 1st. <laughs> There's two chapters there called the government of God. There's not one man on top, one king, president, prime minister. No. That's not God's kingdom government. That is the Gentile form of government. And God doesn't want you to be on top of that. He could be at the second in command. Because God's government, when it says the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, that's not the subject today. So I have to fo keep focusing on my subject today. All citizens of the kingdom of God at the table, yes, around the same father king. Same level. If you're an evangelist, sit down. <laughs> it's not a position, it's not a title, it is a function. God has appointed in the ecclesia to equip the saints. Doesn't matter if you have five PhDs or 20 PhDs or no PhDs. Sit down at the table and let's discuss our father's business, which is the kingdom business. So there's only three major problems. If he can solve these three major problems, every other problem will solve on its own. Because Jesus solved the rest, the sin, the devil, he only took care of it. We don't need to go to heaven to pull down any, any principalities. Jesus did that for us. The problem is these three things. We have a misunderstanding of God, wrong perception of God. People are afraid to try anything new because they are afraid that they will lose. Or God will stop loving them. Or God will throw them to hell because they have played so safe in the religious paradigm, the concept they brought up in. I'm not saying you should go and try something, try something crazy. I'm talking about to, to fulfill your purpose, you have to come out of your comfort zone and everything you believe to be true until now. You have to come out of it. And everybody had to come out of it in the Bible, whether it was Moses, David, Joseph, Esther. Can you imagine? I said Esther last week. Can you imagine a Jewish virgin taken to, a, 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 the, to the palace of a heathen king to become his queen? She never wanted that, maybe. Or Mary becoming pregnant by God. What theology you will fit that into? If that was not prophesied in the Bible, how do you fit that into your theological paradigm of today? Something like that would happening. To fulfill the assignment God has entrusted you, you have to come out of your comfort zone and everything that you are holding so close to yourself. That was part of the religion, not God. So here we go. The journey begins. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. So please read that book, Gospel of the Kingdom, that will tell you why God had to put those true trees in the garden. Because God is a just God. His justice system is so pure and holy. Everything God does is based on his justice system. He's just in all his ways. He won't try to trap you to to trigger you and to tempt you, to cause you to fall. That's not how he thinks. 
That's not how a loving father thinks. Then why you had to do these two trees there? Well, because there was a story. We came in the middle of the movie. Imagine you're watching a movie. You didn't know where the movie began. You walked in the middle of it and you tried to figure it out. That's what we are doing now. We came in the middle of this whole thing that is happening for thousands of years on the earth. And we came in the middle or towards the, towards the end of everything, actually. And there is a whole history. Things that happened to earth after Adam was created and before Adam was created. So please invest yourself five hours reading that book. So out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant. It is God who planted the tree. There is nothing wrong with any trees that are on the earth today. Everything has its use. If we use it according to the purpose and plan. Don't abuse it. Don't misuse it. Don't worship it. Keep them where they belong, like everything else. Every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There comes those two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What were these two trees represented? These two trees represent two kingdoms. The tree of life represents the kingdom of God. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents the kingdom of darkness, which rules over this world through religion and humanism. That's what they represented, these two trees. These two trees represent two systems of life. Either we can live by the tree of life or we can live by the knowledge, activate and live by the knowledge of good and evil. God's intention was, God's perfect will and desire was that Adam would choose the tree of life, not the other tree. Tree of life comes from God because life comes from him. He is the source of life. And it represented him and his kingdom. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented Another system, foreign system that God doesn't want us to live by. But unfortunately, we brought up in it. We were born to it. And we can't even think anything outside of it right now. And these two trees represent God and the enemy. And man had a choice to choose. That's why God created us with willpower the ability to choose. God didn't create us as robots. We have to choose. So Adam could choose the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness, the tree of life system or the, the system of living by knowledge of good and evil. He could go to God when the challenge comes or a or he could go to the enemy's world or depend on himself to solve it. It's all started there. And you only get to choose one tree to eat from. Whatever tree you choose first, you remain in that state. It affects you. The speciality about the tree of life is. Like so, that's why God had to chase Adam and Eve out of the garden and put the God, a cherubim, to guard the entrance to the garden because God said, I don't want this man to eat this tree of life again and remain the same. What does that mean? Whatever state that you eat from that tree, you will remain in that state. So if you're a sinner eating from the tree of life, what happened? You remain a sinner forever. I don't want that. But if you're forgiven, if you're righteous, if you're holy, and you eat from the tree of life, you remain righteous, holy, and forgiven forever. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is an entirely different system. 
So let's read this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 8. 4 to 8. Then the serpent said to the woman. Oh my gosh. If I had to explain about the serpent, it's not a snake that we think of. Okay. Serpent was a creature. Holy Spirit of God, help me. Should I say it or not? <laughs> this serpent is not the snake that we think of crawling on the floor or on the ground. This was a, a spiritual being. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, contradicting God's word. How many contradictions of God's word is there today on God, on people, in the minds of people? God said, the day that you eat from this tree, you will die. What does that mean? You will get separated from me, from my life, from my kingdom. That is the death God was talking about, not just the physical death. Because when the prodigal son came back to the father, the father said, my son was dead. But he was not physically dead. But he was dead in his relationship with his father as a son. That is the death he's talking about here. And, and the devil is saying, you will not surely die. There's another way to live on the earth. There's another system that you can activate and live by where you get to appoint yourself as a god. And you get to decide what is good, what is evil. You don't need to depend on God and his kingdom and this tree of life. That is boring. <laughs> That's what the serpent is saying. No, there's another way to live. You will not die. He's talking about the physical death, the devil. God was talking about the spiritual death. So for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Two eyes. God wants us to live by our spiritual eyes based on what you see in the spirit. Devil wants you to live by what you see with your natural eyes. That is the eyes the enemy is talking about. God is talking about the spiritual eyes. God is talking about the spiritual death. The enemy is talking about the physical death. And the enemy is talking about the physical eye because humans were created to live by what they see in the spirit, not what they see in the natural sight. That's what the Bible says. We don't walk by sight, but by faith. How do you walk by faith? By what God has spoken and shown it to you. That's why the Bible says, I has not seen, ear hath not heard, neither entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. What you see in the spirit. That's why God wants you to see his kingdom when you're born again. He's restoring that spiritual sight. And the enemy is lying to them. Because he wants them to live by what they see. Why they spend billions and billions of dollars on advertisement. Why they show human bodies with products on billboards all over. Because they're tapping into this principle. Because they know humans are led by what they see with their eyes. Natural eyes I'm talking about. But God wants you to live by what you see in the spirit. And manifesting that in the natural why they show human bodies, ladies, women's bodies out there on the billboards and advertisement to entice men and women. Because they want you to live by a mere creature, animal level. When you live by what you see and feel in your body, in the physical realm, we are living in the level of mere animals. And that's what they brought the humans to become, the media, the educational system of this day. Their goal is to bring down humans to the level of mere dogs. They want to steal. That's what the enemies, this thing happened in, that started in Genesis. 
the enemy wanted Adam and Eve not to live by the spirit, what they see in the spirit. They wanted to see by merely by their sight of their natural eyes. And that the goal is still happening today. They're bringing humans life to just to the level of animals. There's nothing uniqueness about you. There's no one thing about you. You're just like anybody else, any other creatures. Do what you feel like doing when you want to do it and be what you want. If you want to be a man, may a man. If you want to be a woman, be a woman. And if you're born as a woman, then you can decide when you're 45, you want to remain as a woman or you want to change to be a man. No, you don't get to do that. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's where the spirit of religion was released to this planet Earth. This is the origin, foundation of every religion. You have to do something to reach God, to be accepted by God, to be like God. And someday, after thousands of years of incarnations and this and that, and you will become like God eventually, and you're, you become part of this great universe somewhere out there. That lie came from here. This is the root. Religious spirit was released to this planet Earth in this verse. Because every religion says the same thing, whether it is Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, whatever, it's the same thing. Is based on your goodness. You will receive something from God. Adam did not receive the garden, his blessing, his spirit, his image, based on his goodness. He received it based on the goodness of God. Somebody say amen. God did not bless Adam based on Adam's goodness. Adam did not ask for nothing. Everything pertains to life and godliness was given to Adam by God. I just said that verse in the beginning, 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Everything pertains to life and godliness was already prepared, provided for Adam. Why? Because God is good. His goodness. And that's why we see in the New Testament when people came to Jesus, he did not bless them or heal them or deliver them based on their goodness or what happened to them. If they married five times or ten times, doesn't matter. It was based on his righteousness and his goodness. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Oh God, this is so good. Amen. But we think Jesus won't accept so many people. That religious spirit is still there. That religious concept is still there. Because that's how we were formed. We have to cast that devil out in Jesus' name. Amen. Because God blesses people based on his goodness, who he is. And then you may ask, Abraham, how come I don't get blessed? Come out of that wrong tree, my dear child of God. Get out of that tree. Run from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Come back to the tree of life. And that's where you find everything you need for life and godliness. Don't waste your time, spend your time on earth asking God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? That's the wrong question coming from this wrong tree. Oh my God, I'm preaching here to somebody. <laughs> I spent 10 years asking God, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And there's quietness, no answer, absolute silence from God. Because I was asking the wrong question. He wants me to be somebody first before he can release me to do the work that he has prepared for me. The moment your identity is established, your assignment will be released. Please write that down. The moment your identity is established in God's kingdom as a son, as a daughter, 
the father will release you to fulfill your assignment. And with that assignment, every provision comes. Many people are still doing religious thing and trying to do religious thing. And they wonder, how come provision is not coming? How come my needs are not met? Get out of that religious mindset that you're still operating from. They're still trying to do good and they're still trying to achieve something. They're try still trying to make things happen. That came from this tree. So the religious spirit was released from this verse, verse 4. And here is the origin of humanism, verse 5. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, here comes ladies and shoppings. Why ladies love to shop? Because that's where it started. <laughs> The window shopping, they saw something glittering, so good. And, oh, that's going to make me so beautiful. And I'm going to be a princess tomorrow. No, God created you as a princess. You don't, you don't need to put any artificial things on you to become something or somebody. Somebody's I am in here. Because I don't preach for offering. You know that. You don't need to do, Amen. put nothing artificial on you to make yourself more beautiful. God created you as a princess and beautiful. Amen. You don't need to look like a Dracula with an extra five-inch nail sticking out. Your, your nail is already beautiful. <laughs> oh my God, I am in trouble here today. With all our wonderful ladies. We Amen. blessed you last week, remember? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, see? And a tree desirable to make one so smart. Wow. If I have to unfold everything that in those lines, it will take me three weeks. Good for food. Pleasant to the eyes, making oneself wise or smarter. It pertains to three dimensions of life that is not of God. One has to do with your physical body, your food, then what you're seeing, deciding based on what you see, and trying to gain wisdom and knowledge and how to's. That doesn't come from God. That's God is not the source of it. And she took off its fruit and she ate. And she also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Why he didn't say anything, you know? He, could, he should have said something. Oh, my dear Adam. Then the eyes of both of them were open. Nothing happened until Adam took the bite. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. What is the result? The first result is these natural eyes were open. They lost the ability to see into the spirit. I couldn't see into the spirit for a long time. I was a believer. I spoke in tongues, but I couldn't see into the spirit. This blindness and it's not just my condition. There are so many people, believers, who have been 40, 50, 60 years. They have no clue what is happening in the spirit. No clue. They're blind as a leech. And I was, I'm telling you the truth. They have no clue what is happening in the spirit. They just go by what they see with their eyes and what they feel. And they need something to feel always to make them good. No clue about what is going on in the spirit. But they are believers. They are born again. They say. And they are both of their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked. What happened? The first thing they realize is. The shame came to them. Shame. My God. As I travel across the globe. And I see in different culture. I grew up in this culture. When the child does something, these parents will shout and say, hey, shame on you. And immediately I will stop them. 
Never speak that over your child, please. Don't put shame on your child because they already came with that nonsense from Eve and Adam. What is shame? Shame is not the absence of clothing, natural clothing. It's much more than that, much deeper than that. Guilt says, I did something wrong. But shame says, I am wrong. And there's no hope to fix this. That is called shame. There's something wrong with me. How many of you said that in your life? Or what is wrong with me, you know? Where's that came from? But that shame. You might be wearing $200 shirt and $500 shoes. But that doesn't cover the shame. That doesn't solve the shame problem. Shame problem goes deeper into our being. That feeling of nakedness, vulnerable. I suppose we don't want to be real with people. So we always put this mask and re religious mask and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to Jesus. And I grew up with that. I don't do that now. And they think, you know, just because they say, praise the Lord, everything is good. No. <laughs> but they still carry the shame inside them. They don't feel good about themselves. They don't feel right. There's something is not right. And they sued fig leaves. So what is the solution they found? They tried to hide. And they tried to make something to cover that shame. And people do all kinds of things. Why people buy artificial things and put it on their bodies and make themselves look this and that way or this way? It is to cover that shame. Imagine... Even after the fall, God came down, clothed Adam and Eve, because that is the father's responsibility. It is his goodness. He killed the lamb and took its skin and made a tunic for Adam and Eve. He said, you don't need to do anything to cover. That's my job, child. That's my responsibility. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness. Do not worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to drink, what you're going to eat. That's not your business. Seek my kingdom. Come back to my kingdom and my righteousness, not based on the righteousness that you got from religion. Seek my righteousness and sin will repel from you. And they made fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord. The third result. One was, first result was, their eyes were open. The wrong eyes were open. The second was shame. And the third is when they hear the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves. That's the next result, hiding. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. There are billions of people hiding. Went, 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 went hiding on this earth today. Eight billion people. They don't want to come before their father and tell them, tell him to face him. And we hide under religiosity, sometimes uniforms and clothes and whatever we do. We are trying to cover our nakedness, our shame. And of fear. So there are two branches that came out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, so what was that verse that the woman was saying? Humanism was birthed. We make the choice for ourselves. That's what the people in the world are fighting for. Is my body my choice? I get to choose my destiny. I get to do this. Everything is me, myself, and I. That's the culture we are growing up. What is that? That came from that verse 5. Humanism was birthed. So these two branches came from the knowledge of good and evil. Is religion. Religion is trying to please God by our performance. By what we do. What is humanism? Taking life into our own hands. Becoming the captain of our destiny. 
Jesus is the captain of our destiny. We were sent here by God to accomplish an assignment for him. He didn't just release Adam and say, okay, now you figure out what you want to do with your life. No, God was very specific. He gave very specific instruction. He put Adam and Eve in the very specific place. He didn't just leave them to figure out life. No, that's not how God operates and his kingdom operates. He has a specific plan. He has a specific assignment for you. And these two branches of three, so religion, God blesses and accepts us based on our performance or qualities. When I do good, God will accept me. When I do evil, God will kill me or punish me. Where did that came from? It came from the wrong tree. God didn't do that. It was not God's fault. And people ask today, if God is good, why he allows all these wars and famines and poverty and evil? God didn't do that. It was not God's fault. It was the fault of the first Adam, the first human who activated that system on the earth. It comes with all kinds of rituals, regulations, and rules. Never promises complete acceptance or an intimate relationship with God. Always you have to do something new. Always there is more to do. More to perform. Longer to perform. You prayed one hour? Okay, you prayed two hours tomorrow because God is going to be happy now because one hour was not enough. No, he's already happy before you started praying because you are his child. So what is the result? What are the results of eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He died. His sonship died. Adam's sonship was taken. It was gone, stolen. His birthright was stolen by the enemy to rule this planet Earth. An enemy used that to establish his kingdom through his seed, the seed of the serpent. So the number one result is the orphan heart. What is an orphan heart? I didn't understand this for a long time. Everybody has to deal with these symptoms in our life. One way or other, at some point in, in your life, you will feel and you will go through a season you felt like you're an orphan. Doesn't matter if you had five siblings, whether it doesn't matter if you're married, your children, you live with 20 people in your home, you will feel like an orphan at some point. Believe me when I say that. Because Jesus told the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come back to you. Because they knew, he knew the moment he leaves, they're going to feel like, orphans who is going to take care of us now where is our food is going to come from because jesus was taking care of us for three and a half years now he is gone where is my lunch is going to come from tomorrow how i'm going to pay my bills and jesus said i will not leave you the the way you because you feel like that is the orphan heart what are the symptoms of an orphan heart there are seven of them if you can write them down Please write them down. I'm going to mention it. There are seven symptoms of an orphan heart. I call it orphan heart syndrome. It's a disease. It's an emotional disease. So number one symptom of an orphan heart is I am not good enough. Number two, nobody likes me. Number three, I don't belong here. That's where this escapist mentality came into the body of Christ. I don't belong on the earth. Earth doesn't belong to me. I'm supposed to be living somewhere up there. I don't belong here. What is the root of it? It's the orphan heart. When you receive the spirit of sonship, you will understand this earth is your inheritance from your father. But an orphan doesn't understand their inheritance because they have no inheritance. Orphans don't get any inheritance. Why? Because they have no father. The third symptom, I, don't, I can't do anything right. Everything I do, somehow it goes as messed up. I can't do anything right. I tried so many things in my life. Nothing worked out so far. 
Where is the problem? Is the orphan heart. But when you operate from the spirit of sonship, you do the will of your father and it will work. Jesus did not run around walking and saying, oh, I tried this, I tried to do that and that didn't work and 20 years was gone. <laughs> no. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my father. Why? That's one of his purpose. Re replace what Adam messed up and show us what and how to live as humans on the earth because he's the prototype. He's the light. And the next symptom of an orphan heart is everybody else is okay except me. Everybody else is doing well. Except me. And the next one is insecurity. My Lord, my God, because of insecurity, the things that people do, the titles they go after, certificates they want, because they feel insecurity and they want to feel significant. And the last one is you feel you're alone. I am alone. I had to face these challenges by myself. When things happen, I'm alone. I'm feeling alone. What is that? Is the orphan syn heart syndrome? And we have to deal with it. We have to address it. It started in Adam. It's not your fault. It didn't start with you and me. It started with Adam. Adam felt like an orphan. The moment he declared independence, from God and his kingdom activated this new system of life called living by the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, okay, you go and try it and live it and come back and tell me how it's going to work for you. I am taking my spirit of sonship. I am taking my kingdom from you. I'm taking my government from you. Now you go and build all those things your own and then come back to me and tell me how it's working for you. <laughs> and we have seen the mess, people of God. We have seen the mess around us. It's not working because it never supposed to work. You can't fix this world's issues. Doesn't matter how you try to fix it, how many NGOs, how many governments, how many trillions of dollars you invest to fix it, it won't. It will just like feel like painting the water, the ocean. The more you paint, it's just mixed into the water. It just disappears. <laughs> you sit there and paint and paint and paint and paint. At the end of the day, there's nothing to be seen. $250 billion invested to just to, to build an aircraft, a fighter jet. Can you believe? To kill people. $250 billion. Where does that come from? It came from the knowledge of good and evil. It's not from the tree of life. You cannot fix the issues of this problem by remaining on the problem itself. You have to get out of it and bring a different system, a different government. You cannot fix Babylon. Babylon must fall. That's what it is set up for. It is set up to fall. It must happen. You cannot tweak it. You cannot fix it. You cannot put new makeup on it. You cannot put a Christian guy on the top and expect to be fixed. No, it will fall. It's supposed to fall. Because it's based on the knowledge of good and evil tree. It shouldn't remain on this earth. It must be uprooted. Every plant my heavenly father did not plant must be uprooted. That's what Jesus said. And the second symptom, my goodness, this is going to take me two months to finish this teaching. I thought I was going to finish this today. The second result of eating from the tree of this knowledge of good and evil is fear. Remember I was telling you, if the first response to your heart, your spirit, to a circumstance or something unexpected happens is fear. You know where is that coming from? It's coming from the wrong tree, the result of the wrong tree, Adam eating from. And the third one is shame. 
And the fourth one is rejection. And the fifth one is guilt. Guilt is what? I did something wrong. All Adam had to admit to tell God was, Father, I'm sorry, I messed it. But Adam was not willing to do that. He tried to cover it on his own works. The performance started there when he started to weave those leaves together to make his first skirt for him and his wife. That's where the performance started to cover it instead of admitting it. I am so sorry, Father. I disobeyed you. Please forgive me. The Father would have forgiven right there. And all this mess could have been avoided. But Adam hid his sin. But Peter repented. That's the difference between Peter and Adam. We all do wrong. We all miss God every now and then. Nobody is perfect. Don't expect anybody to be perfect. Don't expect me to be a perfect guy. Don't put me on a pedestal somewhere up there. Oh, Abraham, don't do that to me, please. Did you hear what I just said? Please don't put me on a pedestal. I am in the same journey with, with you. But I just have a different responsibility, a different function. And we need each other, especially when something goes wrong. Only the body of Christ killed the wounded soldier. Every other government at least tried to take them to the hospital and fix them. But the body of Christ, if you get wounded, Man, they will stab you and kill you. That is an evil system. Must be uprooted. What if Jesus said to the, the Samaritan guy who fell on the road, that's the religion came by, you know? He said, yeah, that is his fault. He shouldn't be out there at that night, you know, walking by the road. That's why he got attacked and they will come up with all these reasons and logic. But here comes the kingdom guy, the Samaritan. He said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to restore that person. Whatever the reason, I will find out later. But right now, he needs help. He needs comfort. He needs some treatment. He needs whatever he needs. You help the person first. Then you go to your answer, your logic and your reasons. And religious things later and condemnation the last one is condemnation living in condemnation is not fun and where this all came from it came from the knowledge of the good and evil tree so father we thank you for this word i have to finish here today but I encourage you to listen to this teaching again. I have said so much because it has to come out of us. This tree, we have to uproot it from our being, from our mind, from our spirit, from our soul, from our body, from around us, the system. It cannot be repaired. It must be uprooted. And we have to go back to the tree of life. And next week or the following week, I am going to share with you this tree of life because in Revelation 22, God said the healing of the nations. Once we are healed, come back to our Father, we can go out and heal the community, the city, and the nations. We cannot heal anything as long as we remain with the knowledge of the good and evil tree. We can talk about it. We can come to other meetings after meetings after meetings and talk, 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 talk. Christians are good at it. They'll come to them and talk about what needs to be done and nobody wants to do anything. This must be done. That must be done. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> and we should not go for looking for another sermon, another teaching until we make it practice, practical what we hear. We shouldn't be looking for new things, new teachings, new excitement. Let's apply it, what we heard. So the Holy Spirit told me, slow down. Don't just teach, 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 teach. 
and then just leave it. <laughs> then somebody, somebody else come and teach something else. No, where are we with applying what we heard? Where are we? What are we doing with what we heard so far? What we read in the books? Who are we married to? Are we still married to religion? Father, we thank you for this afternoon. Father, I didn't plan to say 75% of these things, but you gave me. <laughs> I thought I was going to finish this whole slide, 30 of them, but I only went three. But thank you, Holy Spirit, because you know what we need. Thank you for speaking to me through this, Father. Forgive me for operating under the mindset of religion, judging people based on the knowledge of good and evil. Forgive me, Father. Deliver me from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and its fruit. I'm tired of it. I don't want it anymore in my life. Take me back to the tree of life. And we give you all the glory and praise. This is my prayer. And you pray your prayer. If you are tired of that tree, get rid of it. Get out of it. And we give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to run, people of God. Thank you. But please watch this video again. I encourage you to do so. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you. God bless you.